is required proximally and distally to prevent type 1 endo leaks or leaks around the, um, the top or the bottom of the graft into the aneurysm sac. The Cook graft has suprarenal fixation with a bare metal stent that contains barbs. And here are the proximal and the distal seal zones. So here's a closer look at the Cook Zenith Flex endograft. This is one of several main body devices that come in varying lengths and diameters. All of the grafts have 26 millimeter open um, suprarenal stent with barbs for fixation. And here's a closer look at the suprarenal stent with the barbs. And these barbs are actually quite sharp and pointy. The topmost stent is the covered stent, which is 17 millimeters long, and that corresponds to the area for proximal seal. So although this graft, which has stainless steel stents, probably has the greatest radial force compared to other available devices that have nitinol stents, you can imagine that there's not much flexibility within this top 17 millimeters of covered stent if there was a tortu tortuous or angulated proximal neck. So this configuration helps explain the requirements in the IFU, most uh, namely the length requirement of 15 millimeters of non-aneurysmal infrarenal neck and the angulation requirement having uh, less than 60 degrees of, of um, neck angulation. Of note, this endograft does require pretty good access. It requires anywhere from an 18 to 22 French inner diameter sheath um, for device delivery. But just like everyone else, there's a push towards lower profile devices. And the next generation device, the Zenith LP, will be 16 French ID, which translates to about 18 French OD. So the Medtronic Endurant device is similar to the Cook endograft in that it also has suprarenal fixation, but the stent design is a little bit different. So here's a closer look at the um, Medtronic endograft. Here you see the bare metal stent uh, with the barbs at the top. The graft is comprised of nitinol M stents, which are 10 millimeters high. So this configuration is a little more flexible than the 17 millimeter top stent in the Zenith endograft. And this is reflected in the IFU, which requires 10 millimeters of proximal neck and angulation of up to 60 degrees. The Gore endograft, or the Gore excluder, is a completely infrarenal device. There is no suprarenal stent here. It's based on a nitinol stent Proximal active fixation is through the hooks here at the top of the graft, which are actually within the proximal seal zone. Similar to the Cook endograft, the Gore endograft requires 15 millimeters of proximal neck and up to 60 degrees of angulation. This device can be delivered through an 18 French outer diameter sheath. Um, so Hello? Just as everything is moving towards lower profile, the smallest main bodies for gore, 23 and 26 millimeters, can now be delivered through 16 French sheets. The Endologix device um, is a little bit different from the Cook, Medtronic, and Gore in a couple of ways. This endograph is comprised of cobalt chromium alloy stents that are actually sewn inside the fabric. So when you do your completion angiogram for an Endologix device, the fabric actually billows out a little bit and kind of looks like an endoleak. The system is based on anatomic fixation at the aortic bifurcation, which is distinct from active fixation with barbs, which is what the other three devices that we looked at before have. So even though there's a suprarenal stent here, there are no barbs here, and this is not designed for fixation. So here's a closer look at the endologix graft. Um, here you see, again, there are no barbs up here on the suprarenal stent. The device is actually built up from the bifurcation. The first piece is delivered through a 17 French sheath, and it's a bifurcated main body that's deployed and then pulled down so it sits right on the aortic bifurcation, providing anatomic fixation. And this is actually one of the main advantages of this graft. It's a, it's a good option for patients with a very narrow bifurcation because rather than having two iliac limbs at the bifurcation, which could push on each other and cause kinking, this is all one piece that sits at the aortic bifurcation. So after this first piece is deployed, an aortic extension is deployed, and this builds the graft up to the renals. So again, here is the area of anatomic fixation and the area of proximal seal. So looking at these currently marketed devices, it's apparent that although EVAR works best in patients with what we call good anatomy, 
such as the 15 millimeter non-dilated neck without much angulation and good access vessels, a significant number of patients will fall outside of these device-specific IFUs. So although earlier reports have shown that aneurysms treated with EVAR outside of device-specific IFUs are associated with, with, with worse outcomes, this paper by Andy Shanzer and his colleagues really highlighted the issue. Here, imaging from over 10,000 patients in the M2S database was reviewed. M2S is a large imaging database, um, and it actually provides 3D models from regular CT, and CT angiograms. So the um, authors here compared pre- and post-EVAR CT scans with the goals to evaluate compliance with IFUs, examine changes in compliance with IFUs over time, and determine the relationship between aortoiliac anatomy and aneurysm sac enlargement over time. And here they define aneurysm sac enlargement as anything greater than 5 millimeter increase in sac size. So as you can see here, each device has a slightly different IFU, and the IFU will change over time. The data is, that's stored in M2S, M2S is essentially an imaging database, has no, does not specify which device was used um, for each aneurysm repair. So the authors basically incorporated all of the criteria here into three categories of IFUs and came up with a conservative IFU, which is a conglomerate of the most conservative criteria, the liberal IFU, which is a conglomerate of the most liberal criteria, and a time-dependent IFU. And after reviewing over 30,000 CT scans, the authors found that 58% of patients were treated outside the criteria specified by the most conservative IFU, 31% of patients were treated outside the criteria for the most liberal IFU, and 44% of patients were treated outside the criteria for the time-dependent IFU. So even by the most liberal criteria, almost a third of patients were being treated outside of IFUs. This next table, show, which shows trends in anatomic characteristics over time, over reflect, also reflects how over the last decade, we really started pushing the limits of the IFU on these devices. Not only are we treating more patients over 80, but there's also been a trend towards larger mean proximal neck diameter, more conical necks or reverse tapered necks, and more angulated necks. And these are neck characteristics that we tend to use to characterize you know, hostile proximal neck anatomy. So the authors found that over the course of the study, the rate of aneurysm sac enlargement was 41%, and that this actually increased over the course of the study. And not surprisingly, patients treated outside IFU, whether it was the conservative IFU or the liberal IFU, all had a higher rate of aneurysm sac enlargement over follow-up. So many of the newer devices have been designed to accommodate anatomy that would otherwise fall outside of IFU for existing devices. And one such device is the ovation graph from Trivascular. So this graph offers a solution for patients with challenging proximal neck anatomy, either short necks, conical or reverse tapered necks, or necks with lots of calcium or thrombus. Um, so this device is delivered through a 14 French sheath, so it's also the lowest profile device out on the U.S. market at this time. Like other devices, um, it separates um, fixation and seal. A suprarenal nitinol stent has hooks that provide fixation, and proximal seal is actually provided by this ring, which is located 13 millimeters below the top of the fabric, so below here. So the IFU for this device doesn't require a neck per se, but it does require an inner aortic diameter between 16 and 30 millimeters at 13 millimeters below the lowest renal artery. And this corresponds to the location of this ceiling ring here. Um, so after the main body is unsheathed and deployed, the ceiling ring is filled, filled with a polymer that, as it solidifies, conforms to the aortic wall. Um, so this graph is an option for um, a proximal neck that contains thrombus or calcification or where there's a lot of luminal irregularity, or for a proximal neck, neck that's reverse tapered, where the neck diameter might change over the course of 10 to 15 millimeter standard proximal sealing zone. The one-year outcomes after treatment with the ovation stent graft were recently reported in this prospective multicenter single-arm study that included 169 patients. Um, Interestingly, 
39% of the patients enrolled in this study had aortoiliac anatomy that was outside the IFU for any other FDA-approved device. And this included 25 patients with a proximal neck length less than 10 millimeters and 50 patients with minimum access vessels less than 6 millimeters. Uh, the authors report 100% technical success, and at one year, there were no type 1, 3, or 4 endo leaks identified radiographically. Table 5 shows the number of secondary interventions, and we saw that at one year, there were 10 secondary interventions. Um, so despite the inclusion of shorter necks in this study, this rate of secondary interventions actually compares favorably to the rate of secondary interventions for the currently marketed stent graph. So the one-year data for the ovation graph is actually quite promising, but it's important to note that we have no long-term data. And this study cohort of 169 patients only included 20 women, and we know that women often have smaller access vessels. Um, so that's another challenge to, for devices. Another of the newer devices designed to address the angulated neck is the AR fix. This device has a few different features. First, the fish mouth neck is designed so that the renal arteries are supposed to fit in these grooves in the fish mouth. There are eight hooks, approximately, and this is designed to provide active fixation. Um, and a continuous nitinol wire forms interconnected stent rings. Um, so that this coiled configuration of the nitinol rings allows the device to adapt to a highly angulated neck. So in the U.S., the IFU for this device requires 15 millimeters of proximal seal zone in length, but up to 90 degrees of neck angulation. This graft has been studied in a couple of small prospective observational studies. These two studies looked at patients with extremely angulated necks between 60 and 90 degrees. Although both studies demonstrated high rates of technical success and low rates of stent migration and proximal type 1 endoleak, there were several cases of inaccurate stent deployment that resulted in partial or complete coverage of a visceral vessel. For example, one patient required bilateral renal artery stents um, because of partial coverage of the renal ostea, and one patient um, had severe buttock claudication after coverage of the hypogastric. So finally, the aptus endo anchor uh, is another adjunct to improve proximal fixation and seal and hopefully decrease the rate of graft migration and proximal type 1 endoleak. This is what the anchors look like. They are 3 by 4.5 millimeter length helices that can be delivered through a 16 French delivery device. And the idea is that the anchors mimic a surgical suture line. The um, endo anchors can be used for the treatment of endo leaks or graft migration in previously placed grafts, or they can use, be used prophylactically in patients with complex anatomy. These anchors are compatible with the Cook, Medtronic, and Gore endografts, and you can see here the little anchors sticking out from the top of the graft, and they sort of stick out of the graft into the aortic wall. So. Outcomes using the endo anchors are being collected in the anchor multicenter registry, which so far has 319 patients. 242 are in what they call the primary arm, so these patients had endo anchors implanted at the time of initial EVAR, and 77 are in the revision arm, so these patients had endo anchors implanted due to proximal neck complications after a previous EVAR. So far, the registry has recorded 95% technical success rate and 87.5% procedural success rate. And at a mean follow-up of 9.3 months, there have been no new type 1 endo leaks and no new instances of graft migration. So there are a couple of devices that are still in clinical trials. Um, and here are just three of them. The Gore Iliac branch device is designed for hypogastric preservation. And we didn't really talk about it, but um, it is a bit of an issue in patients who have concomitant iliac aneurysms with their aortic aneurysms. And we know that up to 40% of patients will suffer from claudication after coverage of the hypogastric. So this device um, actually offers an extra branch in the iliac limb so that it's like a bifurcated iliac limb. Um, it's available in Europe, and it's in clinical trials here in the United States. The Nalix device from Endologix is also available in Europe and in clinical trials here. And this takes a whole new approach to treatment of aneurysms by filling and sealing the entire aneurysm sac with this polymer. 
Um, and the goal here is to decrease um, device migration and endoleaks. Finally, the Cordis InCraft device is still in investigational stages worldwide, but it will have the lowest pro profile on the market at 13 French. Um, so how do we manage challenging anatomy in our practice, um, such as patients with um, a proximal neck that is too short or too angulated, or patients with small active access vessels? We have created a handful of patients with the trivascular system, mostly for a short proximal neck with thrombus, None of us um, have used the AOR fix, although it seems to do well in very highly angulated necks. So in our thoughts, um, in patients who are good operative candidates, open repair is still a good option. Uh, sometimes there's just enough infrarenal cuff that with a suprarenal or higher proximal clamp, we can sew a graft to the aorta right below the renals and not have to worry about fenestrations or stents in the visceral vessels. However, a lot of the patients we see with short or angulated proximal necks are not great candidates for open repair, and in those cases, we're lucky to have a rather robust fenestrated EVAR program here. The only FDA-approved fenestrated device on the market in the U.S. is the Cook Zenith fenestrated device. So the Cook Zenith fenestrated graft is a custom-made device that allows for as little as 4 millimeters of normal aorta below the renals. Similar to the Zenith Flex, which is the infrarenal device, there is a bare metal stent um, at the top with barbs for active fixation. The graft com contains up to three custom-cut fenestrations or scallops that allow for perfusion to a combination of renal, SMA, and celiac, depending on the patient anatomy. So small fenestrations are holes in the fabric that are that fit entirely within the stent struts. And these should be stented like you see here for the renals. These are, happen to be bare metal stents and we happen to use eye casts for, through the um, small fenestrations. Large fenestrations are holes in the fabrics that um, cross the struts and these should not be stented. And then scallops are cutouts of the fabric from the proximal margin. And these um, can be stented if you want, but it's not required. Um, these fenestrations allow for the entire device to extend more proximally while maintaining perfusion to the visceral vessels, thus um, moving the seal zone proximally up into presumably more healthy or less angulated aorta. So here's a case we did a couple months ago. Um, it was a 91-year-old gentleman who had a 6.6-centimeter .6 juxtarenal aneurysm. And it's difficult to see here the terror recon was not printing in color yesterday, but this patient has essentially no infrarenal neck. The aorta is ectatic just below the renal arteries. However, the suprarenal aorta is actually quite healthy appearing. So this patient was treated with a Z-fen, the fenestrated device. He had bilateral renal artery small fenestrations, and we put eye cast stents through these fenestrations, a scallop for the SMA, and a scallop for the SMA, and there was no stent there. So here are the completion angiograms from this case. Um, here you can see the, um, the endograft and then the two renal artery stents. And in AP view, you can see perfusion to each of the renal arteries and then the SMA coming back here. And then we always get a lateral view also. Here you see the renal artery stents here and here. Um, and then you can actually get a good view of the SMA on the lateral projection. And then here was his um, six-month follow-up CT angiogram. And you can see the uh, renal artery stents here, the SMA coming out at you, and the remainder of the stent graft. Um, and I think I'll end there and take any questions you might have. That is fantastic, Sherling. I, uh, you know, we, uh, we are not aware of all the technical advances in this field of uh, endovascular repair. I have uh, two questions, if I may go first. Uh, there might be others. First is that, uh, tell us, I see there are lots of options to tackle different anatomical variances. Does it mean that at this point you would offer this in lieu of uh, traditional surgical aneurysm repair? Uh, could you give us a feel for those who do not do it for a living? How do you actually go about selecting patients? And maybe a feel or comparative data in terms of long-term outcomes in comparing patients 
who either can go both ways, both surgical or endovascular repair. Yeah, so, you know, the, I actually had slides about this, but I took them out to make the talk shorter. But um, so there have been a couple of trials comparing in the in infrarenal aneurysms, comparing open repair to EVAR, and um, a couple, to name a few, the big ones are the DREAM trial or the um, EVAR-1 trial out of the UK. DREAM is out of um, the Netherlands. Um, and actually, there was a trial out of the US, the OVER trial, that was actually a VA-based trial. And all of these showed that in the very short terms, the 30-day outcomes, EVAR does better. There's an advantage in terms of um, perioperative morbidity and mortality. But there isn't really much of a difference in their midterm results at two years. And then just maybe two years ago, um, they all published their longer-term results, six- or seven-year follow-up. And in those cases, it looked like EVAR was as durable as open repair. So it, these days, almost all patients um, who would be good candidates for both EVAR or open repair, tend to, we tend to treat them with endovascular repair, just mostly because of the um, better perioperative morbidity and mortality, and we think it's actually a pretty durable repair. Uh, now, when you look at patients with um, sort of marginal anatomy, either small access vessels or um, very angulated necks or very short necks, um, that's when you start looking at um, different ways to treat these patients, um, either fenestrated, one of the newer devices, or open repair. And um, so how I have approach this problem is to risk stratify the patients first and see if they are good candidates um, for open repair. Um, you know, fenestrated grafts do very well in the short term, but they're still pretty new and there isn't a lot of long-term data for them. Um, although the, the long-term data that we've been accumulating two years and up to maybe five years of follow-up has been good, um, but it's not like um, open sort of juxtarenal or type 4 historical abdominal aneurysm repair where we have pretty good, you know, long-term data. So for me, if the patients are, are good um, operative candidates, meaning they have like good quality of life, they don't have many cardiopulmonary comorbidities, they have good renal function because renal function actually has been shown to be one of the um, predictors of poor outcomes in both open juxtarenal aneurysm repair and open type 4 thoracal abdominal aneurysm repair. So if they are good operative candidates, I'll tend to put them into an open repair and do either a, a juxtarenal, open juxtarenal repair or an open uh, type 4 thoracal abdominal aneurysm repair. But if, if they are not good operative candidates, and a lot of our patients are not, um, then we start looking for other ways to fix the fix this, and then we start looking at the, the newer devices, such as, you know, the low-profile trivascular device or um, or putting them into um, a fenestrated, um, using a fenestrated graph for them. Excellent. That's, a, that's an excellent answer. So uh, one last question for me. What is, is there any requirement for antiplatelet or anticoagulation after endographs? Generally, no. Not, not anticoagulation, and even antiplatelet, we try to put almost all our patients on aspirin, and a lot of these patients are on aspirin already, but um, the general feeling is that these stents are so big that it, it doesn't quite, it doesn't make that much of a difference. Now, if you're doing the fenestrated graft, then yes, definitely for the small renal artery stents, you want, definitely want them on aspirin and probably, and oftentimes we'll put them on Plavix also. But yes. Rarely do we put them on, um, like, warfarin. For the standard infrarenal grafts, um, a lot of our patients are already on aspirin anyway. Thank you again. I want to ask, uh, offer the opportunity for anyone else in the audience who dialed in uh, to ask any, uh, any additional questions of Dr. Sai. I'll give you a minute. Uh, you can even text those answers to me, and I'll pass it on. If you have want to ask them or live uh, right now, you're welcome to do so. Uh, that's fantastic. Shirling, if there are any additional questions, I will pass them along if you, you can respond to them. I just want to remind everyone uh, that, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Shirling Sai for making this outstanding presentation. I really, really enjoyed it. This is something that is out of our field that we do not routinely encounter, so it was extremely informative. 
Uh, second is uh, that the recording of and the slides of the presentation will be present, will be posted online on www.xlpad.org. Uh, please log in. Uh, and finally, Dr. Sai, uh, I uh, encourage you to uh, respond to some of the questions if I'm able to pass them on to you by email. Sure. Thank you all, and, and thanks for joining, and let's, I look forward to join, having you all join in on the next month's uh, uh, webcast from xlpad.org. Thank you again. Bye-bye.